Now we move on to the second reading, which is carrying on through the letter to the Ephesians. We're in that part of the letter where Paul is giving advice. He loves this community. He's never been there. There's no record of him ever visiting there. But he knows them, probably from Epaphras, who who evangelized them. So he knows their problems too. And so um, he's, he's starting to give advice now. You see? And so he says, um, in his advice, Now don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You know, on the day of the great judgment, when we all rise from the dead and stand before God, okay, the angels are going to say, you, you got the Holy Spirit, come over here. You, come on over here. You've been sealed already. You have the mark of God, the seal of God on you. You remember in Ezekiel where the angel went around and marked the people with the seal? And then it was picked up in the book of the of Revelation. So we bear the seal of Christ. It's like a spiritual brand mark right here. It says, I belong to Christ. And so, you see, that's what the text is telling us. Do not uh, grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom, by whom, you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, that day of redemption is complete redemption. That is, body and soul with God in heaven forever. We're redeemed, like, essentially, if you will, when we die, go to purgatory if we have to, and then go to heaven. But full redemption means what? Present, body and soul, to God forever. With the very life of the Trinity keeping our body in existence for eternity. So, matter will be eternal in us. Isn't it worth obeying God? And so, don't grieve the Spirit of God with whom you were sealed. That means that when we die, please God, the angel will see that one right up. See that seal? The Spirit dwells in that one. Isn't that beautiful? Then he starts talking while well, he says, now, you know, you live... In, in a community. You live there in Ephesus. You Christians, you kind of live together in the same neighborhood and the others come when they can. And he says now, uh, all bitterness, fury, anger, shouting and reviling must be removed from, your, from, from you along with all malice. He doesn't pull any punches, does he? And he doesn't imagine that they're all just there, la-di-da, you know. No. They're sinners. They have divine life, but they're sinners. And so he says, you see, all bitterness, fury, anger, shouting. He's not saying, you know, just um, you cheat on your third grade spelling exam. I mean, he's talking about fury, anger, bitterness, reviling, and malice. Get rid of it. That's a big order, isn't it? You see? And that's the advice. Now, you see our challenge in, in uh, Western society. Everybody lives in their own little house, surrounded by their own little lawn, or in their own little apartment. And the people next door, we don't even know who they are. They don't know who we are. And uh, that's why people like to move, you know, and you notice Christians doing it more and more, try to move to the same neighborhood. Then when you need a babysitter, you know where you can find one. You know, uh, that you can trust. You know, little Susie next door, she'll do it. She'll be glad for the money. And she'll be watching my kids while we go off and get a night break. You know, we go out and get some supper, a glass of wine, and relax. Because we know at home that the kids are being well looked after, you see. That's a symbol. 
Does that mean there's ever going to be any shouting and reviling? I hope not. But if it happens, you know, get rid of it. Be kind to one another. Compassionate. That takes work, right? That takes work. It takes death to self. You know, I can. I think I, I probably told you this story before, but even if I did, it might be worth... There's a couple... They're very devout, committed Christians, big family, homeschoolers, and they live next to somebody who hates their guts. And he's not a Christian, he's not anything, I don't think. So every once in a while, they bring him over a cake or something and smile and say, here, we'd like you to have this, you know. I don't need it. Slam. Really? So you take, well, the heck with that guy. No, they kept at it. And little by little, they won him over. So now, when he's on the sidewalk there and he sees them come out of their house, he waves, says hello. They've softened that man's heart. The next step will be for the Holy Spirit to work now in that softened heart. And one day, it may be, in heaven he's going to say, My God, you people saved my soul. You preached the gospel to me when I wasn't even interested in it, and you kept at it by loving me and forgiving me from all my stupidity and bitterness. And finally I came to know the Lord. Now here I am with you. You see how important it is. We just can't afford to be ugly. It's easy, but we can't afford to do it. Why? Because other people need to see Christ in us. I told you this story before, I think. I was having lunch with a very holy woman, an Irish woman, uh, in a little restaurant, and I know, Stouffer's, I think, in New York. I don't even know if they're still there. And um, the young woman waiting on us, a very nice girl, I started, ch- I was all dressed like a priest, and I was chatting with her and so forth. I thought, oh, you're from New Jersey, you take the train over every morning. Yeah, we were just chatting. And... Uh, when she left, she had her order. This Irish woman, who was a very holy woman, very courageous woman, she founded the Legion of Mary in France as a British citizen when, under the German occupation. She crawled on her stomach along the, the, the street to get to these places to find the, found the Presidio. Anyway, this woman, the girl leaves and she says to me, That's right, Father. They're looking for Christ in you. I never forgot it. I was just being a nice guy, and all of a sudden, I sobered up. I stand for Christ. This is a responsibility. And you know, it's never been hard. I hear those words every time I enter a restaurant. And uh, somehow, some love, some cheerfulness takes over, and that's what they're talking about here. Compassionate, Forgiving one another as God has forgiven you in Christ. That's good enough, okay? No. It goes on. Be imitators of God as beloved children. And live in love as Christ loved us and handed himself over for us as a sacrificial offering to God for a fragrant aroma. Now, isn't that what our Lord said? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Boy, that's quite a job. He forgives. He loves. He pursues every soul to the last moment, hoping to win them over for eternity. Like that family, always being nice to the neighbor till they win him over. You see, the imitators of God as beloved children. What does that mean? That means I know how beloved I am in the Father's eyes. And that gives me a lot of confidence. I'm not worried about rejection or sarcasm or whatever. I mean, it's going to hurt. I mean, I'm human. But I got the God the Father backing me up. I know He loves me. Now, that's what I try to do in the restaurant or anywhere. Uh, and most of the time, people are really, they like 
other people to be nice to them. Does that mean every time I whip out the gospel and start preaching? No. Maybe that's all I'm supposed to do. I've got a collar on and I'm friendly and, and human and that softens their heart a little bit. Somebody else will finish the job. But you see, now, what about when we're all Christians? Sometimes that's harder. I don't know why. But imitate God as beloved children and live in love. Isn't that in interesting? You know? Um, uh, live in love. As Christ loved us and handed himself over as a sacrificial offering as a to God for a fragrant aroma. You see, that kind of love and forgiveness, that kind of uh, willingness to reach out, that's a fragrant aroma to God. That's very pleasing to God. Because what? It means we're starting to act like our Father. When I say, I'm never going to talk to that guy again, you know, that guy is finished as far as I'm concerned. Suppose God said that about me. Who? Hell is hot and long. You know? So our inspiration comes from God the Father. And so that's this uh, text. Now, the, the middle reading, as you've already observed, doesn't fit the way the Elijah reading and then we're going to be back on John 6, the Eucharist. But sometimes it does, like this time. Where do we get the force, you know, to love, to be kind, to think of the other person, you know, uh, from the Eucharist? That's where it comes from. If we live a Eucharistic life, if we receive the Eucharist, and if possible, even on weekdays. Depends on your schedule and, you know. But uh, that girl that I was so nice to in the restaurant, she well may have been one of hundreds of these young women who came over from Long Island or over from New Jersey and they worked in restaurants back in the days when you couldn't even drink water before communion. And they waited on tables all day till I got their lunch break. And then what did they do? They ran over to St. Patrick's Cathedral for Mass so they could receive the Eucharist. Don't you think our Lord was thrilled with them? How he wanted to guide their lives. Then they would run back and have five minutes to get a bite to eat and then back to work. Uh, and you know, when you walked into one of those restaurants where there would be a three or four of those or maybe more, of these young women, uh, the atmosphere was different. Even the ones who didn't or didn't even believe, they weren't grouchy either. You see, that's uh, the power. And so that's what this text is telling us. But the power to do it comes from the body and blood of Jesus Christ, living in us, changing us even changing our emotional life, changing our physical life, even physical healing and emotional healing that come through the Eucharist. And it's on that foundation that Paul is basing himself in this advice.